cool. So welcome back, everybody, to the Diamond Doors. Uh, I'm MC Owens, as usual. This is the San Francisco Dharma Collective. And um, Happy New Year. And speaking of the new year, uh, this is going to begin a new uh, chapter of the Dharma Doors. Um, as you can see, first off, I don't have my normal whiteboard and background screen. Um, that's kind of for a few reasons that I'm going to go over to start. Um, we are going to work on a sutra, as usual. This is the Dharma Doors, so we're going to study a sutra. But I've decided to take the Sunday night class in a slightly different direction, just slightly. And what that is, is, is that I want to start dedicating the Sunday night classes, um, basically each Sunday night being dedicated to a specific theme or a specific topic that will be the point of the study, the point of the conversation. I will refer to the sutra as our inspiration, as our source of knowledge and wisdom as usual. But the main thing is, is um, and since this is the beginning of a new series, I don't mind taking a little bit of time to, to mention all of this. So I started teaching Buddhism a long time ago, because as many people know, I started as a professor. Uh, I started as a professor at Hunter College in New York, started in the year maybe 1999, but by 2000, uh, we're teaching courses in Buddhism. And the reason why I bring that up is because in order to, let's see, how can I summarize this quickly? So I actually got my undergraduate bachelor's degree at Hunter College in New York. It's where I first, um, not where I first started studying Buddhism, but where I finished my uh, undergraduate study. And my one of my main advisors, one of my teachers, one of my professors was a guy named Robert Foreman. Um, and he it was really influential on me. He was a Hinduism professor. So I kind of um, uh, didn't really learn a lot from him regarding Buddhism per se, but I learned a lot from him about teaching. And so I graduated from Hunter, then went away to graduate school, got all these other degrees, then came back to Hunter College and applied for a job to teach. Uh, and I got the job. Um, but what was ironic or interesting or funny is that to get the job, I basically needed to uh, do a, um, you know, you go through these series of uh, interviews and then you do a, uh, you basically give a class before a panel of teachers. And my former advisor, Robert Foreman, was on the panel. And I came in, you know, full, you know, I'm, I'm a just recently basically graduated uh, from graduate school, you know, a head full of ideas. I got, you know, I got answers. And, you know, I proceeded to give this panel a, a, a course. Um, and, you know, I, I, I got the job, remember, so I, I did an okay job, but I, I got a really important piece of advice from Robert Foreman from my advisor. And then after that, it became a friend of mine, but he gave me one really important piece of advice that I'd love to pass on to you. If you ever have public speaking to do, or you do classes or you do teaching, he said to me, cause I came at this with a bunch of different ideas. And he said, it's a, it's a good plan to, for your class, like if you have an hour class or like I have an hour and a half class here on Sunday nights, he said, it's a good idea to have one idea that you're trying to communicate. One uh, uh, idea or concept, some piece of information that you would really like everyone to, to walk away with and everything else should go to support that one idea versus my one, which I had five, six different ideas and, you know, trying to connect them all together. And, and I really, you know, I took that to heart. And so when I went on to become a professor, my classes were much more focused, much clearer, and I've gotten better and better at that as it's gone along. I feel like I've lost sight of that a little bit with the Sunday Night Dharma doors. In that, I felt like I was trying to cover too much, cover a lot. Um, and Basically, what happened was, is I realized my opening remarks each Sunday night 
would get longer and longer, or there would be questions, and we would have very little time for the sutra. And then I would try to cram in the sutra, and it just wasn't working out. So I'm going back to good old Robert Foreman's advice. And so each Sunday night, we're going to have a theme. But for at least for the next month, month or two or three, or I don't know how long, I am going to dedicate the Dharma doors to basically a study of the, the Bodhisattva path the, or the way of the Bodhisattva. Like, so what does it mean to be a Bodhisattva? What, in, what does the Bodhisattva, in, Bodhisattva path entail? That's what we want to be focusing on. So I chose a sutra that is very focused on the Bodhisattva path, as I usually do. But tonight, as part of an ongoing series that you could drop into on any given Sunday night. <laughs> Tonight, we're gonna to talk about one idea. And the idea that I wanna talk about, it's a great place to start. It's probably the place to start when talking about the path of the Bodhisattva. Tonight, we're gonna to talk about the Bodhisattva vow or what is known as the, the vow of the Bodhisattva. Um, we're gonna, of course, unpack that and complicate that and we're gonna talk about a lot of other ideas but the one idea that we're focusing on is this idea of the vow of the bodhisattva um and so my the main reason that i'm making this shift or this uh, kind of change in in the course of the evening is because i really want to have a lot more engagement i really would like to be here as a resource for you all to answer questions um, and for also for it to not feel like your question might be off topic. And so you maybe want to ask it. I just want this to be wide open, ask anything. I'm talking about the Bodhisattva vow, but if you've got questions, I've got answers. So, all right. So that was the long introduction to the new format. Okay. So now we're going to dive in. Let me tell you a little bit about the sutra. Um, there's a link to a translation of the sutra. The specific sutra that we're going to be working on, but again, the focus is on the idea. So I just want everybody to know that, that the reference for tonight is a sutra that it does come from our normal collection, the Ratnakuta, uh, Maha Ratnakuta Sutra collection, the Great Heap of Jewels. It's one of those, it's number 15 of that collection. And Depending on which translation you go with, whether the Tibetan, which is what the link is for, or the Chinese, this sutra is about the Bodhisattva Manju Shri, right? The crown prince of the Dharma. And depending on whether you're reading the Tibetan or the Chinese, this is either called the Manju Shri uh, uh, Vyakaranya Sutra which is the prediction of Manjushri's attainment of enlightenment. Or in the Tibetan, this is called the, the virtues of Manjushri's Buddha land. <laughs> so, but we don't need to worry about Buddha lands because that's going to be another night. <laughs> what we do want to know, though, is that this is a sutra that's about a bodhisattva named Manjushri, who is kind of at least for Dharma doors, we do a lot of talking about Manjushri Bodhisattva. I've read a number of other sutras in the past that are kind of about this particular Bodhisattva. Um, and so Manjushri is going to kind of be our guide for the next foreseeable future in terms of the Bodhisattva path. Again, I don't know if I'll actually even get to reading this tonight um, because I'm going to do a major digression to talk about what it means to be a bodhisattva. What's the, what is this, what is this? <laughs> um, and as usual, I wanna talk about this kind of in a variety of ways. Primarily what I mean is I wanna talk about this historically in terms of where these ideas came from, what have they meant in the past, but I also want to talk about contemporary practice. I want to talk about your practice if you have questions or ideas or comments. Um, and so I don't, I don't want to make this entirely a history lesson or even kind of a um, that kind of lesson about where this origins, where this came from. I want it to also be very much about practice. All right. So 
in order to dive into this topic of the bodhisattva vow or the vow of the bodhisattva, well, we already have two ideas, <laughs> bodhisattvas and vows, <laughs> two very complicated ideas unto themselves. So let's, I'm going to do this real quick. So let's begin by really defining what a bodhisattva is. Um, I know that many of you are going to he have heard all of this before, but as usual, you can probably always stand to hear it again in a way. Um, so Buddhism, this tradition that started in India <laughs> around 500 BC or so, has always talked about bodhisattvas. And what that word means, bodhisattva, it's very, very, very related to the idea of a Buddha. So, of course, if we're talking about Buddhism, we're talking about Buddha or Buddhas. And what a Buddha is, of course, is an awakened being. It's what the word Buddha literally means is awakened one, one who is awake, bodhi. Bud is the root of that word Buddha, and Bodhi is this word that means awakening, like a, like a flower bud, awakening. And that idea of awakening, of course, is sort of, they're talking about enlightenment, they're talking about um, this sort of um, waking up from the long night of ignorance, as they would say, um, this idea of um, there's something about wisdom, something about knowledge, release, liberation. All of these ideas are involved in the idea of being a awakened one, a Buddha. Then there's a, a Buddhisattva, right? So same root word, Bud, awakening, but not a Buddha not a, a fully awakened being, yet a bodhisattva, <laughs> a bodhisattva, an, a, a being, a sattva of awakening, a bodhisattva. So that's what the word literally means, of course, is awaken a being, a sattva of awakening. And there's some interesting ways to think about that idea, or even, even just that word, bodhisattva. I mention it because, um, well, there's all kinds of sattvas. There's water sattvas, which we would call fish. There's air sattvas that we would call birds or avians. Um, land sattvas. There's humanoid sattvas. There's all kinds of creatures all kinds of beings. A bodhisattva is a being of enlightenment, <laughs> not of the land, not of the sea, not of the air, a being of awakening. Interesting idea there. And that idea that a bodhisattva becomes a Buddha, that's the most basic idea or a most basic definition of a bodhisattva, a Buddha, before they're a Buddha. <laughs> it's a little more complicated than that though. So this is where we get into the more complicated history of this idea of a Bodhisattva. So I'm gonna obviously need to gloss and, and you know, paraphrase a lot of history here, but from the beginning, meaning the beginning of the mythology of Buddhism, the literature of Buddhism, the culture of Buddhism, there's always been one bodhisattva in particular that's been of interest. And that is the being, the bodhisattva, that became Siddhartha Gautama, who became the Buddha known as Shakyamuni, who is the historical Buddha as we know. So the idea is, is that the Buddhist tradition often focuses on the life of not just Siddhartha Gautama, so not just the historical figure who became the Buddha 500 BC or so, 
the bodhisattva actually refers to all the lifetimes of that being leading up to being born as Siddhartha Gautama and then becoming the Buddha Shakyamuni. So what I'm getting at is, is that there's kind of this original concept of a bodhisattva. And it's not just the life of Siddhartha, but it's the whole lifetimes that led to Siddhartha and that led to the enlightenment experience. So that's a bodhisattva, the life of a bodhisattva. And in many ways, what happens is, and this is where I'm really start, going to start paraphrasing. But that life of the bodhisattva, meaning the life of Siddhartha before he became the Buddha, two things kind of happen with that. And what I'm about to get into is this kind of division or a kind of bifurcation or a splitting of the Buddhist tradition that occurred Mm, somewhat gradually over time, it started, this divide began seemingly even in the lifetime of the Buddha, but definitely started picking up speed right after the Buddha died. And what I'm getting at is, is that there's this divide or this kind of original split in Buddhism, normally talked about in terms of Mahayana Buddhism and Hinayana Buddhism the great vehicle or in the little vehicle. We, of course, know of a specific tradition in the world today called the Theravada Buddhist tradition, the way of the elders, which is sort of the modern, it's the remaining Hinayana school. There were actually many Hinayana schools. One remains known as the Theravada. So that's still in the world today. But let's kind of back up a little bit. There's a lot of different ways to define the the split between Mahayana and Hinayana. Without going into super great detail in all of the nitty gritty, there's kind of, I mean, there's so many things that make these two traditions a little different. The one thing that I want to say from the beginning, though, is, is that Nobody knows where this split began and nobody knows in a way, you know, this question of like, well, if, if, if these, if this tradition called Buddhism split, which of these two is representing the real Dharma is kind of a question or an idea. And, you know, that might already be a misleading question from the beginning, or it kind of an erroneous path to go down. But let's not even go down that. In fact, it's so erroneous. But what I'm getting at is, is that the history of this is so murky. It's, it's best to not even speculate and just respect that Buddhism split into these two different modes. And of course, these are very general modes that I'm talking about of which underneath it, you get specific schools, specific teachers, specific leaders, specific texts, like all of that. But the general divide between the Mahayana and the so-called Hinayana, the general divide comes down to, well, there's a way in which it's very slight. The difference is very slight. And there's a way in which the difference is huge. It, that, that basically they almost shouldn't even be spoken about as the same tradition. But then if you look at it again, it's exactly the same tradition. <laughs> so let's unpack that now. And so one of the things that it would seem, if you were to ask me my educated guess on the development of these two, is that the so-called Hinayana probably does represent an earlier, more original form of Buddhism. In fact, many of the Mahayana Buddhist texts and Buddhist sutras kind of even speak of it, that the Hinayana is the first form. Now, the idea, though, is is that the Buddha maybe developed 
his teaching, changed his teaching, expanded his teaching or something to that effect. And that became the Mahayana. But there's a way in which many people, myself included, do understand that the Theravada tradition that we have in the world today probably does represent that early, very, very early Buddhist tradition. And that very, very early Buddhist tradition was clearly, it's nobody's saying it wasn't, it was a ascetic meditation cult. <laughs> and I use that word cult in the technical definition of it, which is the idea that a cult is, has a living leader. And as soon as the leader dies, they tend to start become religions. But if you study religion academically, like I did, traditionally, one of the defining characteristics of a cult is that the leader is still alive, is charismatic, and getting people to join their tradition. Then when the leader dies, it can then become a religion or something to that effect. So Again, that's more of a technical anthropological definition of cult. But my point is, is that the Buddha seemingly was charismatic in that he got those to follow him. And what it meant to follow the Buddha in the very early days was to renounce, to leave the household life. And leaving the household life meant undertaking a life of poverty, homelessness, and celibacy. Those were sort of three of the main ones that you didn't own anything and you begged for food, you begged for clothing, you didn't live anywhere, you sought shelter, but you didn't actually own a home and you didn't, you didn't call anywhere home and you took a vow of celibacy and that, you know, it was an extreme vow of celibacy, but that certainly cut off having family, having children, all of that. So in the early days of Buddhism, it was pretty clear that that's what it meant to be a Buddhist. And in that environment, the Buddha was, and still is, so I'm including the modern Theravada in this, the Buddha is considered the great founder, the great guru, the great teacher who figured all this out, who taught all of this information, all the Dharma. And within the early Buddhist tradition, which again is still preserved in this Theravada, the Buddha is revered, it is extremely revered. And revered in many ways, but in particular, the idea of the Theravada. So this early, and this is now a Hinayana idea. The notion is, is that a Buddha, a fully awakened being, is a very rare occurrence. <laughs> it, it, a Buddha comes around once a couple kalpas. Sometimes it go, it, it's many kalpas, and kalpas are eons and eons of time. And so the idea is, is that the a Buddha, a fully awakened being, it's it's rare for it to ever happen. The fact that it happened in our world is considered miraculous. And so in the that early tradition, also represented by Theravada, they revere this anomaly, truly like in the idea of the anomaly, like, wow, where'd this person come from? And then what happens in the Theravada tradition is the great guru, the great teacher, they're the life and lifetimes of the great teacher, which is to say the career, and they even use that word, the career of the bodhisattva, all of the past lives of Siddhartha, the life of Siddhartha as a prince, the life of Siddhartha when he gave up the throne, the life of Siddhartha when he per, uh, performed austerities in the forest, the life of Siddhartha when he defeated Mara under the Bodhi tree and became the Buddha. All of that, the lifetimes leading up to the birth, leading up to the renunciation, leading up to the asceticism, and then leading up to the enlightenment, that became this sort of hero's journey of the Buddha. And so what I'm getting at is, is that in the early, like 
after the death of the Buddha, but in the early days of Buddhist culture, so still very much BC, before the common era, there started to emerge a kind of mythology. And it was this mythology about the past lives of the Buddha. And it was this kind of, again, a kind of hero's journey in that kind of Joseph Campbell Jungian sense where the life of the Buddha became this kind of this story. And again, like this hero's journey. So that's the Theravada tradition. They're, they're celibate, they're homeless, they're wanderers. They tend in the early days, and actually still in a sense, they tend to be forest dwellers, meaning they don't reside in the cities. They typically, the idea was that the Buddhists, meaning the early Buddhist schools, that was the meditation cult, <laughs> they would live sort of, or they would set up little encampments near the city. And then in the mornings, they would go into the city, beg for food, go back out to the forest and meditate, and then do that the next day. But my point is, is that the early Buddhist tradition, this Hinayana, was very removed from the mundane world, put it that way. It was, it was renunciatory in many ways. And one was not to go really in like go you go beg but don't go to the theater don't go to the shows don't go to the marketplace all of that was was kind of a no-no you were supposed to be meditating so that's the hinayana really focused on meditation out in the woods begging for food let me finish I'll, let me finish that narrative so the, in the Hinayana, the idea was, is that if, you know, if it was 500 BC and the Buddha rolled through your town and maybe the Buddha gave a Dharma talk and you heard what the Buddha said and you were like, you know what? I don't want to be a farmer like my dad. You know what? I don't want to get married like my uncle and so-and-so. That, that what the Buddha said sounded good to me. Sign me up you would renounce. And so you would shave your head and you would be given some robes and you would start begging and then you would go off. And the basic idea, again, I'm about to paraphrase and summarize a bunch of stuff, but the basic idea is, is that upon doing that, you were called a stream enterer. You had entered the stream, a shrutapanna. And this idea was, is that you were now going against the current of reincarnation. You were going against the current of the transmigratory flow of samsara. And so because you were going against the current of cyclical reincarnation, you had entered the stream. And then there were a series of stages that you would go through through your cultivation of meditation practice, of calming the mind, you would go through these successive stages of attainments that were marked by someone in the original days, it was the Buddha, but then later on it, become, it became revered teachers. But you would eventually be deemed a once returner, meaning you only had one more rebirth. And that was a very high level of attainment to only have one more uh, human rebirth or just rebirth. If you kept going, though, you could actually become a non-returner where you were guaranteed, again, not re having rebirth in this realm, only rebirth in some kind of transitory heavenly realm to finish up your practice in that way. Or if you liked what the Buddha had said and you left home and you followed the path, the marga, all the way to its conclusion, you became an arhat, a worthy one. And an arhat, a worthy one, and this is debated in different schools, but as a, as a general gloss, the basic idea of, of being an arhat, of achieving the goal of the Hinayana path, is that you attained nirvana, or nibbana in the Pali language. So nirvana was the goal. 
And what is nirvana, you may ask? Well, without digressing into a whole other Dharma talk about nirvana, let's recall that the basic teaching of Buddhism is about craving, wanting, desire, this kind of, well, this kind of addictive like attachment to the things of the world, a kind of desperate needing of entertainment or a desperate needing of things in a way that we, in a way the Buddhist teaching is that we all burn with this desire. And that because we don't know about the the problems of this desire, we keep trying to satisfy it. <laughs> and we're like, oh, this didn't work. Maybe I'll try this. Oh, this didn't work. I'll try that. And so through all the desperate trying to satisfy that which is insatiable in that sense, we're kind of suffering as a result. That's called the dukkha. The dukkha is being caused, caused by this desiring. And so again, what the Buddha said is that it's, it's like we're all on fire with desire. There's a famous early Buddhist sutra called the Fire Sutra, in which the Buddha talks about the eyes are on fire, on fire with the desire to see things. The ears are on fire, on fire with the desire to hear things, and so on through the sensory organs until this whole thing is on fire with desire. Nirvana, Literally, the word nirvana in Sanskrit means to blow out or blown out like a candle. And the idea of nirvana is that that very fire that we burn with, that fire of desire, in an arhat, that fire has been put out. And to put out that burning fire of desire is basically nirvana. And to do that, by the way, ceases the production of a certain kind of karma that gets you reincarnated. Because from a Buddhist point of view, it's that very desire for this world that keeps us coming back to it. And that's actually an interesting insight for those who are familiar with Hinduism or other Indian religions. Buddhism is interesting for saying that the reason why we keep getting reincarnated is because we want to. We love it here. We keep coming back for more. And it, it's not actually so much a matter of being punished for past actions as it is, is actually getting exactly what you asked for in a way. And that is sort of an interesting realization within the realm of Buddhism as it pertains to reincarnation. What I mean is the stream enterer becomes a once returner, when their desire for this world lessens, and then they become a non-returner when they're totally over it. And then they become an arhat when actually all desire is gone, even that those trace amounts in that sense. And that was it. Boom. <laughs> Flame of desire is out. You're chilling in nirvana. You're uh, non-confrontational, non-contentious, very tranquil chill, polite individual. I mean, you know, the Arhats, they're considered very chill people in that way. That's the idea. They're not suffering from desire. Okay, so I just laid out the Hinayana path in a very, very quick summary. And I did it in a way to set up some ideas. Any questions actually about that? Questions, ideas about the Hinayana path? Yeah, no. Yeah, I have a question. When you talked about the Buddha's life, the hero's journey, I, I actually thought you were about to move into the Mahayana and the Bodhisattva, but you didn't. You were still in the Hinayana. So I'm just curious, like, what role does that play in the Hinayana? Good, um, good ears, Noam. So I too realized that I was starting to diverge into the Mahayana when I said that. And it was a little premature, which is why I backed off. But what I did wanna do was explain that there was this, it's a bunch of um, literature that is this, the mythology of the life of the Buddha that comes out of the Hinayana schools. 
But what happens, thanks for the transition, by the way, Noam, unless there's any other questions about the Hinayana path. So what starts to happen is, is in this Mahayana tradition. So again, I wanna say it, the Mahayana goes way back. And as far as we have historical records, it's always right there with the Hinayana. But again, even the Mahayana traditions, they even they say that, oh yeah, the first thing the Buddha taught everybody was to chill out, <laughs> like to get control of your, your sexuality, get control of your anger. Like, yeah, you got to chill out everybody. But then the idea is, is that after, um, in fact, I think it's about, 10, a, a decade, 10 to 12 years or so, the Buddha shifted gears, they say, and he started teaching some other things after everybody had sort of gotten the basics in that way. And then this is the beginning of the Mahayana tradition, which again is an umbrella term basically for anything that is not <laughs> Hinayana. So this was my first lesson as a student of Buddhism rather than a Buddhist. Having studied Buddhism in school, I learned all about Mahayana Buddhism. And then after I got out of college, I went out into the world looking for Mahayana Buddhism. <laughs> and you don't really find it. You find specific schools of Buddhism, Zen Buddhism, Tantric, Tibetan Buddhism, these. But nobody really presents themselves as a Mahayana Buddhist. They tend to present themselves as a Obaku Zen Buddhist priest or something more specific. So Mahayana is this general category, but it has, that general category has a few defining characteristics. And I would su suggest that the defining characteristic of the Mahayana is the Bodhisattva path. So comes, that brings us to tonight's topic. So we already know what a bodhisattva is, at least the idea, like the word, and that it has something to do with a Buddha, meaning that it's the Buddha before he was the Buddha, or a Buddha before they are the Buddha. Something happens in the Mahayana tradition, and you could really write several dissertations, and many people have, on exactly why and what, what happened and why. But something did happen. And what happened was in this Mahayana tradition, the, the whole point of it was not to follow the Buddha and attain nirvana as per her, his guidance. In the Mahayana, the goal, if you, if, and I say that really hesitantly because it's part of the subtle teachings of the Mahayana, but the goal of the Mahayana is Buddhahood, <laughs> is being a Buddha, a fully awakened being, not the follower of a Buddha. Or at least that's one of the Mahayana critiques of the early path, the Hinayana path that it's kind of incomplete because they remain students. They remain what are called voice hearers. And so what happens in the Mahayana is it starts to become this idea of, and, and this happens by the way, if you wanted to trace this, I would really suggest looking at the Vajra Pranyaparamita Sutra. I know I mentioned this Sutra a lot. You may know it as the Diamond Sutra the Vajra Sutra, as it's called. I mentioned this sutra a lot, but it's because it's so important. It's because it's, it's an important historically, and it's important in terms of the ideas that are in it. And if you're not familiar with the Vajra Pranyaparamita Sutra, it's a pretty short sutra. Again, it's one of the more famous Mahayana sutras. And it's a simple dialogue between the Buddha and a monk named Subhuti. But what Subhuti asks the Buddha in that sutra, and it's the specific language of it that I want to get into tonight, but the basic question is the Subhuti asks the Buddha, well, 
suppose, and I want, actually, I'll give you the real language. It's really important language. Sabuti asks, suppose a virtuous man or a virtuous woman wanted to be a Buddha, what do they do? That's the basic question. Specifically, Subhuti asks, how, do, how, do, how would you control or tame or subdue your mind? <laughs> it's literally what the question is. If somebody wanted to be a Buddha, how would they control their mind? What would they do then? And that begins this dialogue with Subhuti that outlines this slightly other path and I, again, I, I know many of you are already know a lot of these distinctions, and so you are, are very familiar with that, what I mean when I say that the distinction is huge and there's almost no distinction. It's, it's really very interesting. It's very subtle. And so I, hopefully tonight we can tease that out a little further of like how it is that Hinayana and Mahayana Buddhism are exactly the same thing and how it is they are diametrically opposed to one another. Okay, so let's go deeper. So in the Vajrapanyaparamita Sutra, the specific language that Subhuti uses to talk to the Buddha, the specific question he asks is, how, if a virtu how do virtuous men and virtuous women Abi nir, it's abi nir hara, abi nir hara, anutara samyak sambodhicitta. That's in Sanskrit, this idea. It is usually translated as, oh, I don't even know, you know, um, um, I guess a normal translation is, is uh, generate the mind of supreme unsurpassable enlightenment. That, that's how that's translated. And it has a few different components. It has the idea, which I would say is the verb. And it's this verb, which means to generate or bring about, to bring forth. That's this abhinirhara, abhinirhara, abhinirhaha, something like that. Then what it is that the virtuous man or virtuous woman is generating is a specific kind of citta, C-I-T-T-A, a specific kind of mind state. So if you're familiar with Buddhism, of course, you know about citta. Citta is the idea of mind, but in Buddhism, it's very important to keep, to remember that it is a state of mind. A chitta refers to any given state of mind at any given moment, an angry state of mind, a love-filled state of mind, a dharma-filled state of mind. But at any given moment, depending upon the karmic situation, the mind state's going to be different. So that's a chitta. And the specific kind of chitta that, the, that Subhuti asks about is anuttara samyak sambodhi chitta. So that's the idea. So anuttara samyak sambodhi, chitta, the, a mind state. How does somebody generate a mind state that is anuttara samyak sambodhi? Anuttara, the highest. You can't get any higher than this. It's anuttara. Samyak, incomparable totally perfect, totally correct, total. So Anuttara Samyak are, um, you know, they are describing this state, that it is the highest, unsurpassable, supreme, Sam Bodhi. And there's that word again, Bodhi. Bodhi, Bodhisattva, the root of the word Buddha, awakening. So that's where we started this Dharma talk tonight, but this idea of Bodhi means awakening. So Anuttara Samyak Sambodhi is the supreme, highest, unsurpassable, awakened state 
of a Buddha. That's, it's a long, crazy Sanskrit word, Anuttara Samyak Sambodhi, but it's a very important, long, crazy Sanskrit word. <laughs> and what I mean by that is, is that this idea of Anuttara Samyak Sambodhi, this is the, well, I'm going to do it again. This is the goal, and I'm putting that in big scare quotes and all of that. Anuttara Samyak Sambodhi is like the goal of the Bodhisattva path. It's complicated because of the nature of goals and goal seeking. It's not really right at all. So I, I but the reason why I say that even pr preliminarily is because I really want to at least expediently for tonight, I want to set up that the, ar the path of the arhat, the Hinayana, the early school of Buddhism, it ends at nirvana, the cessation of suffering, the cessation of the burning fire of desire. The bodhisattva path includes nirvana, but it doesn't end at nirvana it actually goes all the way to the supreme, unsurpassed, unenlightened state of a Buddha. Okay, so I just wanted to set that up preliminarily, that that's one thing that makes these two different paths. But now let me dig a little deeper into that idea. There, this is where we start to get to a very deep fundamental divide in these two schools or these two traditions. The thing about the Hinayana, the thing about that early school of Buddhism, the, it's those schools, the view, the view of what's going on here, the view of reality, the view of samsara, the view of, of this is basically that we are, we are each how can I put this succinctly, that we are each kind of responsible for our own karma and we can only kind of do anything about our own karma. And what I mean by that is, is that the Hinayana practice is about clearing out your mind, your mind. And the idea is, is that the Buddha in the original teachings, it, you know, it's a user's manual for being a human being. <laughs> it, it is literally like the Dr. Spock's guide to being a human is that early Buddhist path of like, I know you've got a mind. I know you're suffering. We can get through this. And the idea was, is that that path that included jhanic meditation, that included samadhi, that includes uh, moral discipline that includes all of these things, the entire practice is called actually, there's a very famous book. It's not a sutra. It's not from the Buddha. It's from a monk, but there's a very famous Hinayana Theravada text called the Visuddhi Magha, the path of purification. And the Visuddhi Magga is literally like the Dr. Spock's guide to being a human. It is a summary written by a monk, but it's a summary of the Dharma, or at least the early Dharma. And if you study it and you look at it and you read it and you practice it, what it's going to teach you is how to purify yourself. And I know that the language of purification is tricky and I'm kind of, I'm very sensitive to that language. So I don't really like to use it that much, but it's the language that they use. And so I'm sticking to it for now. And the idea again is, is that our minds are cluttered with anger, cluttered with desire, cluttered with confusion. And the process, the Visuddhi Magga, the path of purification, is about extracting all of that, extracting all that anger, the poisons, the three poisons. It's about extracting those poisons. And then when you have fully extracted all of those poisons, then 
you're pure. And again, if you purify yourself all the way, that's nirvana and you're not going to get reborn and you're not going to suffer anymore. And there's, you know, that's, that's it. <laughs> According to the Hinayana. And so the first thing that I want to say before we do the Mahayana version is that the Mahayana includes everything I just said. It just doesn't stop there. It, it, it goes much, much further. So that's where in many ways, these are the same tradition or maybe they're not in that way. So any questions about, again, about that Hinayana path? The one thing that I don't want to do is I do not want to put this path down. I'm not here to put down purifying our minds. It's, it's not what this is about. But it is about how at least 2,000 years ago, there's plenty of evidence that this was again going on even much earlier than that. There seems to have been a, a much larger group of Buddhists and by larger, I mean by population, by the size of their population and numbers and their geographical spread, by the way, this Mahayana tradition of which there were a bunch of different groups pretty much spread out ge by their geographical differences. And there the emphasis again was on not Nirvana, but Anuttara Samyak Sambuddhi, the supreme unsurpassable enlightened state of a Buddha. And what that meant was is that in the Mahayana tradition, we're not going to follow the path of the Arhat, which is the follower of a Buddha. What we're going to do is we're actually going to look at all of that mythology that described that hero's journey of Siddhartha. And we're going to take that as suggestions for practice. So that right there is the beginning of the difference because the Mahayana practitioner is actually not normally called a stream enterer. And the Mahayana tradition normally does not employ the use of the language of once returner, non returner, and arhat. Rather than stream entry, in the Mahayana tradition, when and this is a little tricky because I haven't fully explained it to you yet. But after I do fully explain this path, if it sounds good to you and you're like, oh, oh, the Arhat Nirvana thing sounded good, but that sounds even better. If you are like, yeah, I want to do that version, then it's not about entering the stream. It's about becoming a Bodhisattva. And so what I'm getting at is, is that in the Mahayana Buddhist tradition, when one, well, I guess I, I need to tell you more about what it is. And then that is what makes one a Bodhisattva, that you're on that path. So what you may already know, or I should say what you may have already heard is that the idea that a bodhisattva in the Mahayana Buddhist tradition, a bodhisattva has this idea that they're not going to actually attain nirvana until all sentient beings attain nirvana before them. That is sometimes how the vow, the bodhisattva vow is articulated. And so that gets us and directly to tonight's topic, finally, after only after an hour, we come to the idea of the Bodhisattva vow. And again, the Bodhisattva vow is normally glossed, normally just summarized as this idea that a Bodhisattva makes a vow to not achieve nirvana until all sentient beings achieve nirvana before them. That was the one that I was taught oh so many years ago. And Although I think it, it, it gets the sentiment, it's not really right, exactly. It's not really kind of the right way to be thinking about it. If, you know, we could start with the idea that Nirvana within the Mahayana Buddhist tradition, um, Bodhisattvas chill out in Nirvana like a hot tub. 
the Nirv bodhisattvas can go in and out of nirvana whenever they want is part of the idea and so it's not that they are putting off nirvana until everybody gets there before them it's actually that part of the bodhisattva path is that nirvana is just one step in this long much longer process in that way so let me get deeper into what kind of the bodhisattva vow is quote really about and now i when i say really all about that is i say that with a tremendous amount of um sarcasm i don't know what it's really all about right so this is according to me my interpretation um, and please take all of this as my interpretation so there is this thing that within the Mahayana Buddhist tradition, there is this thing about a, a bodhisattva making a kind of a vow, or at least it's called a vow. And the way that I wanted to talk about vows, so actually let's just kind of shift gears and just talk about vows for a second. Just, just that idea. Then we'll bring it back to the bodhisattva vow. But you know, a vow, as it's used in English, you know, we talk about wedding vows. So that's kind of the main go-to. And the idea is, is it's kind of about making a promise in that sense, um, agreeing to something in that way for a very long time, I think is implied in the idea of a vow. There's sort of, the way that I have always read the bodhisattva vow. Like, you know me, I read a lot of sutras, I teach a lot of sutras. And the way that the bodhisattva vow is normally described in the sutras is it usually kind of has a, it kind of like twofold, twofold aspects. So it's just one idea, but it kind of has these two aspects to it. One aspect of the vow is the the vow or yeah the vow to attain omniscience what is called sarvanyana all knowing all knowledge it is again pretty much synonymous with anuttara samyak sambodhi the fully enlightened state of a buddha so the bodhisattva makes this vow to achieve the state of a Buddha. Okay, well, I pretty much have already said that. But there's sort of an, another aspect to the vow, and this is where it gets really subtle and really tricky. The essence of the, essence of the bodhisattva vow is actually not, or, or when we say sarvanyana, omniscience, we, we need to understand exactly what the Buddhists mean by that. And how could I, let me put it to you this way. I don't have omniscience. I, I promise you, I don't have omniscience. I don't have sarvanyana. And I can, I'll kind of explain to you how I know I don't have sarvanyana. There's a way in which, say, you take this class that's going on right now. There's a way in which I have my sort of vantage point on what's happening here. And so I know about it. My knowledge, my knowing, my nyana is very limited to sort of what I can see right now, what I can hear right now, and kind of literally my position in space and time. And what I'm getting at is, is that I know that each of you are having your own um, experience of this, right? And I don't have access to that. That right there tells me I don't have Sarvanyana. That right there tells me I'm not omniscient because otherwise I would actually be able to know what it is like to see this from your angle, know what this is like to hear it from your angle. That's all part of sarvanyana. Um, if I were to use other um, 
uh, or use Buddhist language, this is about knowing the minds of all sentient beings. That is a way of describing sarvanyana as well. And what I'm getting at is, is that when we first hear this idea of omniscience, like, ooh, the Buddha's omniscience and omniscient and knows everything. When we first hear this, when I first heard this, I, of course, couldn't help but understand it from my human, all too human point of view. And I, of course, thought of that, of like, oh, what would that be like to know everything? But of course, the way that I'm thinking about that is, what would it be like for me to know everything? And what I'm getting at in a subtle way is how that me is really standing as an obstruction <laughs> to Sarvanyana. It actually keeps me <laughs> penned in to not having Sarvanyana. Oh, okay, that's interesting. Okay, so hold on to that idea that then sarvanyana all knowledge you couldn't be locked into one position okay now when i tell you that the bodhisattva makes this vow or sets this intention which is probably a better way to say it sets this intention of achieving sarvanyana all knowledge the the knowledge of the minds of all sentient beings and there's kind of a, a tacit implication to the vow, which is in the attaining of sarvanyana, in the attainment of the knowledge of the minds of all sentient beings, I am releasing attachment to the self, which has always been the project. <laughs> In Buddhism, from day one, in all schools of Buddhism, that is always going to be the, the thing. We're angry, we're wanty, and we're confused about the nature of the self. And actually, it's that confusion about the nature of the self that makes us angry and wanty. So dealing with this confused nature of the self is, has always been key in Buddhism. And so that process of relinquishing attachment to the delusional sense of self takes on two different ways of doing that, the arhat way and the bodhisattva way. So both the bodhisattva and the arhat, both the practitioner in the Mahayana and the practitioner in the Hinayana are both sort of very interested in rele releasing attachment to the delusion of self. In the Hinayana, that process ends as soon as the individual has let go of attachment to their self. The bodhisattva vow one aspect of it is the attainment of this omniscience. The other aspect of it, which is kind of the really important part of it, the Bodhisattva basically vows to instill that same unsurpassable enlightened state in all sentient beings. That's where you start to get this idea that the Bodhisattva makes a vow to save all sentient beings or to put off their own enlightenment until all other beings have achieved nirvana before them. Those are all trying to say the same thing, which is that the Bodhisattva has the liberation of all sentient beings in mind. And what makes this so subtle is there's, a, there's an idea that I haven't mentioned tonight. I've almost made it the entire night without mentioning this idea. And it's, it's going to be the topic of one of these Sunday nights, of course. 
But I haven't mentioned this really important idea of emptiness, shunyata. So this will probably be sort of the last point that I'll try to include in tonight regarding this bodhisattva vow and actually just regarding the bodhisattva path and Mahayana in general. Although the idea of emptiness, shunyata, although it is very much a part of the Hinayana and Hinayana suttas and part of the early Buddhist discourse, it's the idea of emptiness that really gets kind of chosen out of a lot of the early Buddhist ideas as the jewel of the Dharma in a way. And the Mahayana kind of really keeps going with this idea of emptiness. And so what I mean to say is, is that the idea of shunyata or emptiness is present in the early school, but it doesn't really come to its full philosophical fruition until the Mahayana. So the basic idea, and I have enough time to do this, I think. So the basic idea is in the early Buddhist tradition, the Hinayana, the idea of no self, anatma or anatta or anatman. In the early Buddhist tradition, they understood as all Buddhists are, teach that the notion that we have of ourselves is a delusion. It's a, it's a fabrication, a figment. Um, it's, it's like we're all having a, um, you know, an anxiety attack <laughs> and it feels like a self, but there is no self there, but it feels like it is. So there's that. And so what I mean is, and I kind of often like to emphasize this point, when the Buddhists talk about no self and releasing attachment to the self, it's a, about the wisdom that there just isn't that Michael that I think there is. So that's this idea of no self. And in the early Hinayana, that was, a, that was, the, that was confusion. That was moha, thinking there was a self. And if you could kind of knock that idea out of, out of yourself, out of it, the, I, the teaching, of course, is that this is an amalgamation of the five aggregates, the five skandhas, form, sensation, perception, conditioning, and consciousness, in an ever-changing, ever-morphing process dance. And the persistent, consistent self that I think is there all the time, that's the delusion. And so the early Hinayana, no self revealed a kind of present experiencer without a self, but there was still kind of this idea in early Buddhism that there's kind of a, what, what I kind of call a sensory meat bag. So there's like a sensory meat bag here that's like feeling things and seeing things. And it's a present experience that then gets, gets attached to body, attached to mind ideas, and then a self idea generates. And it gets anxious and dukkha filled and all of that. So the Hinayana deals with that self to basically reach this state of a peaceful meat bag, a peaceful sensory meat bag in that way. So no self, five skandhas. That's the sensory meat bag in that sense. If you've read the Heart Sutra, one of the key texts, one of the key sutras for Mahayana Buddhism, what that sutra says very succinctly, very concisely, is that the bodhisattva realizes that the skandhas are empty. And that is actually as simple of a statement as that is, that is the, the Mahayana revolution. That, oh no, 
not only is there no self, even the skandhas are selfless in a way, meaning they're empty. So the emptiness of all dharmas, as it's called, the emptiness of all phenomena, that's kind of a, a hallmark of Mahayana Buddhism. The Bodhisattva is very much about understanding that emptiness, understanding the emptiness of the skandhas, understanding the emptiness of all phenomena. And so this brings us to um, the, the, the trickiest part of the evening. So I mentioned that the Bodhisattva vow is about attaining sarvanyana, or omniscience, and simultaneously instilling that same awakening in all sentient beings. All sentient beings, by the way, not just every other human being. Buddhism is great for not being specious in that sense. It's about all sentient beings. But here's the thing about the Bodhisattva. Not only does the Bodhisattva know, kind of coming into this, that there's no self to be a bodhisattva, that there's no self and also no selves out there, because that's what the Buddha taught and we understand the Dharma, so there's no self, but the Buddha also taught in the Mahayana tradition, the emptiness of all dharmas, which would include me and include you. So the Bodhisattva finds themselves in this very interesting position of vowing to liberate all sentient beings, knowing fully well that there is no such thing as a sentient being. That's all, again, a very different project than clearing out the defilements of one's mind which again, that's the Arhat path, cleaning out the defilements of one's mind. And again, that's great. We should all clear out the defilements of our own mind. Absolutely. But then taking this next step of the Bodhisattva vow, and now I can more clearly kind of articulate what my understanding and interpretation of the Bodhisattva vow is you should know or keep in mind that the Hinayana, that early Buddhist tradition, they kind of have a vow as well. They have a kind of a, 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 an intention, it, the, the idea of samkalpa, right intention. And the idea of right intention, and it's basically the vow of early Buddhism, it's the vow to renounce. It's the vow to, to tread the path. And ultimately, it's the vow to attain nirvana for oneself. And again, I don't, I'm not saying this in a de uh, deprecating, derogatory way. It's, it's not about that. There are certain Buddhist texts, certain Buddhist traditions that are a little derogatory towards the Hinayana path. Accusing it of being, uh, accusing it of being too narrow. It's why they call it the little path or the little vehicle. I'm not doing that. Again, I'm I'm suggesting it's a part of the bodhisattva path to clear out the defilements of their own mind. But there's a next step in the bodhisattva path, and that's it's the step that it's the step that Thich Nhat Hanh, the Vietnamese Zen master, calls socially engaged Buddhism. Mahayana Buddhism is socially engaged Buddhism from the beginning, and it's socially engaged because it understands, or at least it's part of the Bodhisattva path, that the practice is about liberating others. And the thing about it is, is that what the Bodhisattva understands going into this is that liberating others is liberating themselves. It, 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 that is how it works. So 
that's um yeah let me let me finish that thought unless there's any questions comments answers ideas as usual so let me finish that idea of the saving or rescuing or liberating all sentient beings idea and i'm going to tie that in with what i said before about emptiness and this idea that a bodhisattva knows all sentient beings are empty right so an example that I've given in other Dharma doors, and I want to bring it back to this one, it's, it's an interesting analogy. It, for me, um, it involves a dream or dreaming in that way. So it's one of those classic dream analogies. And the idea is, is that imagine, so we're going to go through this in three stages. And I've done this before, but again, I think it's a good uh, end or two tonight. So I'm going to go through a dream with you in three stages. The deluded, ignorant, suffering human being stage, the arhat stage, and then the bodhisattva stage. It goes like this. So I find myself in a dream, but it's one of those dreams where I don't know I'm dreaming. So I mis mistake it for reality. And in that dream, I meet someone that causes anger in me, right? And the idea, of course, is that it's somebody in, in reality who I have may anger issues with. I don't know, maybe it's one of my parents, maybe it's my whoever, whatever, it doesn't really matter choose your own uh, person in that way. But the idea is, is that in this realm, in this reality here now, you, there's some of you might have anger issues with, let's say. And then you find yourself in a dream, but you think it's real and you see that person and they make you angry and you start kind of projecting anger onto that person. And so there you are full of anger, full of desire, full of confusion, full of the defilements. And you're suffering in that sense, because you're like, ah, oh, I wish this person would go away or da, 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 right? So that's the normal deluded way of dealing with anger and dealing with other people in anger, right? Let's say that you were to then something happen and you were to have a lucid dream and you were aware oh, this isn't real. I'm in a dream and the person isn't really the person that I'm angry at. The arhat now can peacefully be at peace in the dream and can actually, in a way, tolerate being next to this person because they are chilled out. They know, oh, it's not really the person. And so they're done with the anger and they're peaceful. Again, that's great. It's better than being deluded and being angry. Excellent. The bodhisattva, that next step though, the bodhisattva is the, is the practitioner that's gone a little further in thinking about this. And what the idea is, is that the Bodhisattva realizes that in that dream, that person that they've met is themselves, quite literally. Like that it's the mental projection that they have in their mind that they've been carrying around of this person. And so the Bodhisattva realizes, oh, wow, that's me. I should actually be extending loving kindness, compassion, empathic joy to that person. So not only am I not projecting anger and not only am I peacefully tolerant of the person, I'm actually extending metta, loving kindness to the person, because I actually realize that they're an aspect of my own mind. So 
here's the thing about that from a Buddhist point of view to tie this in with the Bodhisattva path. So hopefully my dream analogy makes sense, the, those three stages. So now here we are in reality, reality, like waking reality in that sense. Same thing can go on. I can run into that person and they make me angry and I could heap anger at them and they could be a big anger fest. I could get control of my emotional state. I could realize that the anger is not doing anybody any good, especially me. And so I could put the anger out and I could actually be in the presence of this person and no anger, totally chilled out. And yes, that would be better than being angry at them. But are you ready to go the next step? and actually start extending loving kindness and compassion towards that person. But here's the thing about it. I, I'll, I'll share this with everybody. So on many, many years ago now, I don't even know, well over 10 years ago. Um, oh no, it's longer than that. Time, time is moving along. So long time ago. I, through my study of Dharma, through my, my uh, understanding of Buddhism, I had a great realization um, regarding my father. So, like all young people, issues with my parents, maybe anger issues with my parents, yada, 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 right? But one day, again, through this Dharma, through my study, I had a realization. And what it was, it, it's hard to explain because these things are so emotional and so personal. But what I realized was that when I see my father, I don't see Howard Owens. I see my father. And the perspective of my father started when he was much bigger than me, and so that left impressions in, in my mind regarding his magnanimity, regarding all of these ideas. And there was a day that I realized that my father is my own special being because it's, it's the relationship I have with that person. And I realized that my mother, she's in a relationship with an, an entirely different person than my father. Even though, of course, biologically, what have you, they're the same person. But I realized that the one that I see, the one that I'm angry at, the one that I'm looking at is uniquely my own. And that does make my literal father, not my dream father, my literal father, an aspect of my own mind, deeply, an aspect of my own mind. And so that's when I realized, wow, if I'm angry at my father, I'm literally angry at myself, an aspect of myself in a way. And a deeper part of that was the realization of, oh, and this anger then, it will never reach Howard, if that makes sense, because I'm directing it at my father, which is all up here. And so that's sort of an, a way of talking about the Bodhisattva vow that for me is, is less um, bleeding heart liberal, must save everybody. And it's actually this really subtle form of wisdom that's predicated on emptiness, that's predicated on compassion, wisdom, all of these things. And it makes it a very subtle practice, of course, but I hope I've just done a good job at, at, at extolling its virtues in that way, um, but also just sort of setting it apart from that other way of being Buddhist. So questions, comments, answers, ideas? Thanks, Noe. So great to see you. Cool. So I hope all that makes sense. 
Um, so the Bodhisattva vow. And so now I hope, oh, as a, just to let me just conclude that then, that one idea. So I, I said that the Bodhisattva vow has these two aspects, attaining omniscience and liberating all sentient beings. And if everything I've just said about how every sentient being I know is an aspect of my own mind, then my, pers my working, my helping them attain nirvana is, or enlightenment is my enlightenment in that way and my ultimate attainment of sarvanyana. So I'm just hoping you can see how this all makes sense, of course, you know, but getting, getting there is another thing, I think, so. All right, everybody, I'm going to end it there. Awesome. Thanks so much, Michael. Ah, my pleasure. That was oh, good. Wonderful.